Welcome to the Better Than Rich Show with your hosts, Andrew Biggs and Mike Abramowitz. The Better Than Rich Show helps ambitious leaders who are on a mission to leave the world better than they found it, change their perspective on what's important, increase their income and impact, and systemize their life and business. If you've ever struggled with finding your purpose, have felt disconnected or distracted, or found yourself going through the motions, this show will remind you that what you do matters and will re-inspire you to chase your highest dreams. It's time for you to become better than rich. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Better Than Rich Show. I'm your host, Andrew Biggs, and I'm here with my co-host, Mike Abramowitz. Mike, how you doing today? Feeling good. We had a doctor's appointment this morning with James. He's doing good and good. ready to rock and roll. We're feeling good. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, a uh, bit of housekeeping before we dive into today's topic, which is how to find your core values. Uh, we are doing uh, a contest right now. If you rate and review us, uh, you'll get put into a raffle. So what you need to do is just give us a rating, give us a review on Apple Podcasts. Let us know what you think of the show thus far. And uh, we will go ahead and put you into the raffle in the coming weeks here to win the Better Than Rich water bottle. Uh, Mike, you have a, a rating you want to share with us and a review you want to share with us real quick? Yes, from Ali and Drew 2. They said, five stars, such a big fan of this show. Better Than Rich is an amazing community, and I love how these podcasts capture some of the value that this community provides. One of my favorite shows right now, exclamation point. Mm. So we don't know who you are, Ali and Drew, but we appreciate you. Thank you so much uh, for your support. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, so, Mike, I, you know, we were jamming a little bit here about the topic ahead of uh, today's uh, recording and talking about the idea of finding your core values. And, you know, one of the first questions that came up for me that I'd love to pose to you as a starting point is the importance of knowing your values. Like, why does that even matter because you know the reality is i think a lot of people don't know their values i talk to them i say hey what what do you really value what do you care about and uh you know sometimes they have answers but they haven't really thought deeply about it what what comes up for you when you think about why um knowing your values matters well for me by me getting clear of my values i was able it helps with my decision making so whenever Mm -hmm. i'm saying yes to one thing or saying no to something else it it typically is under the umbrella of, well, let me look at my values list first. So it helps with my decision making. What does decision mean? Where does that come from? A Latin rooted word meaning to cut off from. So when I want to cut Mm. off from something, I want to make sure that I'm being guided by principles, not by emotions. So I want to make sure that, okay, let me figure out what I'm anchored to. And what am I, what do I want to be anchored to? Do I want to be anchored to emotions that are like the waves in the ocean that are constantly changing? Or do I want to be anchored to the mountain or the ocean floor that's not going to move? And I think about our core values being uh, the foundation that's not going to move, uh, that is going to be, we're going to be able to be anchored to something that is stationary and that's going to help us with our decision making. That's what immediately shows up for me. Right, right. And so what I'm hearing you say, and I agree with this, is that values are basically like a filter so that you can actually make decisions that are in alignment with them. And you can use it as a filtering process to say, should I go left? Should I go right? Well, let me see what's more in alignment with my values. Oh, it seems like because I value integrity, I should tell the truth here. I'm going to go with option A. Uh, versus option B or or whatever that may be. And ultimately, um, so many people haven't thought deeply about that, that when they find themselves, uh, you know, in the position of having to make a decision, uh, they're kind of blown about by the wind, right? Um, You know, uh, whether you're a biblical person or not, you know, we think about the story of the man who builds his house upon the sand. And, you know, the story in the in the Bible is, well, there's, you know, some people build their homes upon the sand. And, you know, when the storm comes, it collapses uh, versus other people building their their houses upon the solid rock. And with those people, they're able, they're able to hold this withhold the storm. And of course, that has a different meaning biblically. But if we just look at it from a practical perspective, you know, when you are foundationally clear, when you're super clear on your identity, when you've defined who you are and you know what your values are, there's so many benefits to that because you're not kind of, you know, you don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to be, uh, you know, batted around by the circumstances of life. Even if things aren't going your way, you have something to, to rely on. You have something to to come back to. And I, I just think that it's so important. And so, 
Yeah, Mike, when you think about how to actually go about finding your values, what comes up for you there? Well, I mean, I did this activity uh, in 2018, uh, and I have, uh, for mm. those watching on YouTube, I have my little uh, sign here. And I did this in 2018, and I went through a list of all of um, probably 200 or 300 <laughs> different words to pick out and to getting to my core six. And um, that activity is very popular. A lot of people have gone through it, and it's just like a bunch of different words, and you just narrow it down by half. So if it starts with 200, then it's like, all right, get to 100. Once you get to 100, then get to 50. Once you get to 50, get to 25. Once you get to 25, get to 12 or 13. Once you get to 12 or 13, can you narrow it down to the top five or six? And it's a fun activity. I definitely recommend you doing that if you haven't done so yet. And then once I was able to do that, um, I was able to figure out the words that fit in bo most with me. Now, back in 2018, it was abundant life, influence, jovial, openness, resolve, and optimistic. And it was really cool because those are the words that I needed most in 2018, 2017, 2018. I needed a little bit more practice in, in feeling the, the gratitude and feeling the, um, the beauty of life around me. And then influence was number two. And then jovial, feeling playful and cheerful and fun. From there, I, um, I've evolved them. So I do, this, I do this every year just to see if I want to adapt or adjust or modify and just making sure that this is my leading principle where I want to lead. And this year uh, for 2022, I moved influence to the top. So influence is now number one. And then I changed up some of the words. I made jovial fun since jovial started losing meaning to me. It's like I don't use that word all the time. So I, move, I changed the word jovial to fun. And I move that into number two. And then uh, I moved number three became faith. So I moved optimistic and I changed the word optimistic to faith. Mm -hmm. And I moved that to number three. I, I kept openness as number four, but I changed the word openness to love. And then I changed the word resolve to courage for number five. And then abundant life became number six. And I changed that to the word free. So now mine is influence, fun, faith, love, courage, free. And then we could talk in a moment about like the definitions of these, but yeah. a lot of them are the same definitions as these other words. And I define them very, very much similar. But now by me leading with influence versus leading with abundant life during the last couple of years, the decision making has been in alignment with being a person of influence, a person who contributes to meaningful work that makes a positive difference in people's life. And mm. because I'm clear with my number one, and then getting even more clear with my number two of fun, making sure I'm enjoying the process and experience playful expressions in each moment, mm. by being, being able to do those two things, life, the lens of my life has been completely shifted versus abundant life backed by influence. Yeah, That's totally. A lot of response there, but. Yeah, but since you're on a roll, I have a follow-up question. Like, what is, you know, and by the way, if you were uh, watching alongside on the YouTube or you're live with us, uh, I threw some potential uh, uh, words up there on the screen. So if you want to go back and screenshot that, you certainly can. Um, Mike, help me understand what are, like, when you talk about the actual definitions of these words, you, you know, you've often said that that really matters to you as well. Why do you need to actually take the time to define what they mean to you um, versus just kind of having a list of five words, like, or five, six words? What do you, what do you think there? Yeah. Well, well, it's a good question because when, at least for me, when I just see the word, it, it sometimes uh, gives me a different feeling or a different meaning sometimes, depending on, uh, depending on when I see it, like especially words that are overused all the time, like the word stress sure. or happiness. Like people say these words all the time, but they don't really, if you had to ask them a follow-up question is like, how do you define stress or how do you define happiness? And sometimes they get a little stuck. So uh, I think premeditating the definition of the word um, just gives the meaning. And what's the meaning? The meaning is, um, is more of like the emotional juice and the clarity of what the word actually means to me. So why is that important? Well, I'm able to uh, I'm able to read my my uh, definitions every day. So I look at mine. I call it a shot of positivity, and then it allows me to question: like, am I in alignment not with just the word, but with the, how the how mm -hmm. I define the word? And again, I'm, I feel like I'm just kind of dancing around the answer, but that's mm -hmm. what it does for me. Um, 
maybe you could ask the same question differently if I didn't. No, I think it's, I think it's great. I mean, basically if I were to summarize back what I heard, it's you are taking the word and then you're stripping it of maybe what, um, the, the, whatever connotations the, the society at large may have. And then you're basically, you know, defining it for yourself. It's obviously not completely different, but you're defining it for yourself. And then you're reviewing that definition daily and asking yourself, you know, whether it's, hey, on a scale from one to 10 or one to five or whatever, how how in alignment with this value have I been in the last 24 hours? How in alignment with this uh, this value of courage or abundant life or influence have I been in the last, you know, seven days, 30 days, et cetera? And yeah. I mean, what a great practice, right? And so, because oftentimes the other the other problem I see with people making their values is they, they come up with their values and then they throw them in a drawer somewhere or they're stuck in a notebook in the closet and they never look back at them. So uh, just another great reminder there. Yeah. And, and the point that um, that helped me, you helped me a ton with this because mm. a, a lot of the people I surrounded myself with said their values are like family, faith. Sure fitness, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, the, they'll use like the F's and, the, and that works great. And I love finances. That. Yeah. Finances. Yeah. Right? So, so it's like, <laughs> these are their, these are the F's that they value. And I think that's fantastic, but not that I don't value my family. I do value my family, but the way you described it to me was the values that you want to continue to embody even more to express what you want to express to your family. It's more mm-hmm. of like, I wouldn't say they're verbs, but it's like they're, they are more of like action oriented words. So when I use the word courage, and that's my number five value, and my definition of that is to live big and push through discomfort, commanding my presence. Why is that important? And when I hear courage and I hear it, I think almost like vulnerability is to be willing mm-hmm. to uh, push through discomfort and being willing is, is what, what comes for me for, for courage versus if somebody else hears courage, they might just think uh, like a firefighter storming in and kicking down mm. the door or like, a, you know, a Marine being courageous in that way, where my interpretation of courage and my definition of courage is more of the way I wanted to interpret courage um, from my lens and for what I need to show up for my family. Not that I don't value family, mm. but I value showing up in a courageous way for my family. I value having love defined as ability to receive full enjoyment and joy from the smallest gifts in life mm. consistently and unconsciously. Mm. Now, I, I want to value my family, but I'd much rather value love inside the relationships with my family from that definition. Again, this was, this was a conversation you knew you and I had when you were coaching me back probably around 2018. So probably about mm-hmm. four years ago was when I was really digging into a lot of this and, and the, these lessons stuck with me um, since then. And it was actually, I, I think it was also anchored in, in a, an immersion event that I went to in San Francisco that yeah. you were facilitating too, where we really deep dove into some of these, um, some of these principles as well. So there's the power of like, not only doing my own reflection, my own work, but also having you as a coach and then also going into an immersion, immersive event Mm-hmm. Uh, so there was a lot of hours and time and and uh, dollars invested into getting this clear on some of this stuff a few years later. Right. And, and again, this is just a great example where if you're kind of reflexively saying that your values are one thing, um, you know, oftentimes you kind of just have these like these go to phrases. OK, my my value, my number one value is family. Family is everything. It's like, OK, you know, that that may well be true. And maybe that's how you're showing up right now. Um, but is it is it useful to 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 think that way? Is it useful to to you know is that going to change how you show up? Because if all it means is you're going to spend more time with your family, but while you're spending time with your family, you're just sitting on your phone playing video games, then you're probably you know not really valuing family the way you say. So how about presence? You know, using the word presence, then bring that into your family. Mike used the word courage, but what is it that you're going to use to move? these initiatives that you have in your life, like connection with your family forward. Uh, so these are just some, some really great points. Um, another exercise I like to you know put people through, besides kind of the, the word war that Mike described, um, is to actually go back into your past and think about um, two things. One is peak experiences. And, and you can ask yourself, when was I, like when did I feel the most alive? What was a peak experience moment that I had? 
uh, a mountaintop moment and literally maybe you were on a mountaintop and that and you felt super alive or maybe it was a mountaintop in your career or it's mountain type with your family or a relationship or uh, a really interesting conversation you had with a friend that you know changed your life or changed their life or some moment where you just felt like you lost track of of your suffering you lost track of time and you were just super present you felt so alive in that moment uh, and it could it, it doesn't have to be just a moment, I would say. It could also be kind of like a period of time. Oh, in the summer of 2009 or whatever it is, you could look back and say, that's when I felt really alive. Or, you know, in the fall of, of 2017, that, like it could be a period of time for sure too. And then what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, how was I showing up at that time? What values was I living by? What values was I embodying at that time that helped me feel so alive? and make a list of those. And uh, the other exercise I want you to do is do, a, do the opposite of that. Go back and look at your regrets. Go back and look at moments where you, uh, you really actually hated that experience. You, you feel like you uh, did something you shouldn't have done, right? Or you didn't do something you know you should have done. You didn't stand up for yourself or you didn't fight back when you knew you were supposed to or take a stand when you should have or, or taken that step of courage when you should have. And go back to those regret moments and ask yourself, what values did I betray in those moments? During those periods of time, what values was I not embodying that has left me feeling so sticky and icky and gross about that period of time uh, because I was betraying my deepest values in that moment. And what you're gonna find through that exercise a lot of times is you're gonna find some themes, right? So then you look for the themes and you do some meaning making and say, okay, these are the themes that I'm recognizing through these exercises. These are the themes that I saw in my my word war. These are the themes I got from my peak experiences from and my regrets. And now you can start to kind of whittle some things down uh, because, again, a lot of times when I ask people their values, they say what they want their values to be, uh, not necessarily what um, or what they think they should say, if that makes sense, Mike. You know, I'll let you kind of riff on that a little bit. Yeah. But a lot of times they're just like, yeah, you know, my, my biggest value is, you know, family or my biggest value is fitness. And it's like, well, you know, you don't spend any time with your family and you're 50 pounds overweight. So uh, you're probably not accurate, right? Um, so anyways, uh, what, what comes up for you on this? And, and partially due to that is it lacks the emotional juice, I think, is what it comes yeah, down to. Yeah. Like they're, they're, they're doing it because that's what they're, they feel like they're supposed to say. So what you what you mentioned, um, you think about like the the regrets or the heaviness from your past or the decisions that maybe you messed uh, missed uh, at some point. That's partially why I uh, maneuvered some of my word choicing and some of my values from influence backed by fun, because I um, I was I bit I like to believe at least I like to tell myself that I try to be as influential as possible in a lot of the different relationships that I'm in, depending on which relationship and which hat I'm wearing at the moment. But sometimes by by being in this position of, of authority or this position of uh, um, of persuasiveness or, or, or person of influence consistently, sometimes it'll it, I, I would personally put myself on such a high pedestal that I was putting so much pressure on myself. And I was guilty of putting this pressure of like, I have to be right. And it's and started like almost creating mm-hmm. this righteousness, which made me not enjoy it as much. So that's why my second value, I intentionally made it fun. So when I read it in my order of influence backed by fun, I'm reminding myself of it's okay to mess up. Like it's okay to enjoy the process. Like in fact, the playful expressions in the moment are necessary. So sometimes while I'm in the middle of a rant, sometimes I'll catch myself being so intense that I'm like, I got to lighten this up a little bit. How can I make this a little bit more enjoyable for myself and others involved? And sometimes I'll throw something inappropriate oftentimes because that's my sense of humor, uh, just to kind of throw it in there. But uh, And then I back it up with faith because I, w- I do want to make sure that I am honoring this, this relationship with uncertainty. Because uh, the uncertainty in in my life as of recent, uh, during the last uh, you know couple of years, as we've you know I've I, as Lindsay and I entered into marriage and then entered into uh, uh, attempted parenthood when we we had a stillbirth at 20 weeks, and then you know the the uncertainties with James of being born at uh, you know one pound at 26 weeks. It's like mm. all of this uncertainty, really finding this faith of this vision of an exciting future, even if it's going different than planned you know, with COVID or pandemic, like even if it goes different than planned, having this 
vision of an exciting future. So influence backed by fun, backed by faith, those big three in that order are very intentional. So the point I'm making and, and that you really brought, brought out and drew out of me in this, Andrew, was what you said is looking through your past and looking at your lens of, you know, as I'm creating my core values, what do I want to make sure I have a little bit more of? What, where, where did I miss it a little bit? Where, where was I kind of, where were some of the heaviness and how can you maybe even position and the mm. order of your values slightly modified based upon what you want or what you want to be reminded of the next time you have a chance to uh, live that moment? Uh, I just uh, was listening to a podcast this morning and um, it was a really beautiful quote that he said. I, I put it on my Instagram because I loved it. He said, faith and love are theory until tested. Faith and love are theory until tested. And I loved it so mm, much because mm. two of those, you know, but faith and love are, are two of my four values. And it is true. These values mm. are all theory. Like this whole lesson and topic that we're talking about is like, theoretically, this sounds really nice. When we need these values, though, when we need to call upon them, that's when the, you know, the real fruit happens when Andrew, your, your wife is, you know, get, doing the pregnancy at home. And then all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> oh, shoot, she needs to go to the hospital and I'm taking care of Gabe while she's going to the hospital. And I also have Eli here. It's like we tried to do this home birth. Oh, my God. At, at four in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Four, yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's like that's when we get a chance to use the core values. So all of the activity mm. what we're talking about now of figuring out your core values is for when you need them. So it's, mm -hmm. you don't use the core values every day. Sometimes you do. But it's also the reminders every day to help you when you actually need them, because it's all theory until you need them. Yeah, I love that. Uh, it's all theory until it's tested. Until tested and yeah. um, you know, it's so true, you know, kind of the old the old saying about what, you know, someone's values, at least historically have been is to take a look at their uh, their their wallet and take a look at their calendar. And uh, that'll tell you what their their real values are. And so that might be like an interesting audit for you as you're listening to think about where am I spending my money and how, where am I spending my time? And those two can give you some really interesting hints about how you're showing up right now and then ask yourself, well, am I proud of that? Am I proud of how I'm spending my time? Am I excited about where I'm spending my money? Um, you know, it looks like I've dedicated, you ever get like the screen time notification, Mike? Uh, and you're like, holy shit, like I've spent so much time on this thing called the phone or whatever, uh, you know, and you're like, my, my gosh, is that possible, right? And maybe there's a justification. It's like, well, sometimes I use it for work or whatever, but it's like, yeah, but like, no, that's too much time. You are not in alignment with what you are purporting your values are. And so it's an opportunity to think back to it. So uh, just another little trick for you is to look at where you're spending your money, where you're spending your time. And it should be a really, really interesting hint about what you really are valuing. Because a lot of times our conscious mind and our unconscious mind are in a war, right? And it's like our conscious mind's like, I value faith and love and influence and, and impact. And your unconscious mind is like, I actually value, you know, escape. And I actually value, um, you know, pride, distraction, uh, power, ego, right? And so there's this war between like our baser selves and our more enlightened selves, right? And I mean, this isn't my theory. This you can go back to, to Freud and, and Jung and, and all these things. Not that I agree everything that they've ever said, but it's pretty well established in the field of psychology that our, psych our subconscious mind is oftentimes driving the action. So what I love about what you're talking about is you're actually programming your mind when you say, I forget what the exact quote you said about love is, but you literally tell, you're telling yourself that you're going to experience love unconsciously. And so every morning you're reminding your unconscious to act in a certain way and then it can go about and do it. So, um, you know, I, I also yeah. think this idea of like, it's kind of like practice, right? Uh, I'll, I'll ask you what you think about this, but you mentioned like, okay, during the, the delivery of the home birth or during the challenges that you faced in the last two years, that's when it's really being tested. And also, if on a more regular basis, we're not practicing this, then at the moment of, of the game time, we're going to fail, right? So what can people do when it is practice, when it is shoot around, when the stakes aren't as high? Because I feel like if they're not in rhythm, um, you know, once the game starts, then they really don't have a chance to make the shot. So what are your, what are your thoughts there? 
Yeah, I put this in my first book, Your Best Year Ever, uh, Grab Tomorrow, Your Best Year Ever. And and the, the concept that stood with me is intentional growth versus circumstantial growth. And the idea is that mm. uh, people wait to grow due to circumstances, circumstances of their of death of a loved one, circumstances of a disaster, a divorce of their parents or a divorce of, the, you know, with their significant other or, you know, some sort of debt. So, you know, so it's a lot of the D's, divorce, death, debt, disasters. Mm -hmm. A lot of the D's is what circumstances, oftentimes people wait. And that's when they choose growth. It's like, all right, now I have to grow. grow. I don't have another choice. Disease, that's another D, right? So what the idea is, circumstantial growth is when we have to, we, we don't have a choice. Intentional growth is when we have the choice. So intentional growth would be like running the marathon. Intentional growth would be waking up at five in the morning. Intentional growth would be doing a fast, you know, uh, mm -hmm. intentional mm -hmm. growth. Is, so these are the things that are intentional growth that prepares us for the circumstantial growth. So when I think about practicing core values, when I think about intentionally going to an immersion event, intentionally hiring a coach, intentionally doing the personal growth and self-development work, intentionally reading books versus Netflix, intentionally listening to podcasts versus, versus music, you know, intentionally feeding our mind and feeding our bodies, intentionally drinking a gallon of water a day. You know, these are intentions to prepare for when the debt, the disease, the disaster, the, the divorce or any of this stuff happens. And sometimes by doing the intentional work, some of those D's get mitigated a little bit uh, and um, because we're, sure. we're preparing ourselves. Yeah. And it's like, you know, we're, we're not waiting until the very last moment right, to hit quote unquote rock bottom to make it a change, right? Um, and so, you know, hopefully, you know, you haven't gotten as far into debt, right? Or your marriage hasn't gotten, you know, so close to the brink of divorce that you, you know, until you start making uh, intentional choices. You you haven't really diseased the, the body. Uh, it's only just needs some minor tweaks uh, if you catch it sooner. And so that intentionality, um, yeah, can ward off some of the some of the uh, disasters and the catastrophe of life um, that is in some ways inevitable. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't mean you're completely going to, it doesn't mean you're completely going to get rid of suffering by any means, right? Uh, that's not what this podcast is going to tell you, but uh, we definitely feel like you can, uh, at least if, I'm, if I may speak for you in that, Mike, I think you can definitely improve your life, right? By being intentional. So uh, what were yeah. you trying to say there? The responsiveness, you're, you're mm -hmm. positioning yourself to be responsible, which is the ability, able to respond, responsibility, ability to respond. And we're equipping ourselves with that. So the idea of the values as you go through them and uh, you're, you're being anchored to something, you're being mm -hmm. anchored to principles. And that's, that's ultimately what we want for everyone that's listening right now. Can you be anchored to principles that, um, that you, when tested, when circumstances arise, you can respond, whether it be with your business or with your relationships, you know, or with your own decision making. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think it's a great, a great topic that I'm glad we're jamming on this because it's relevant. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, you know, is there anything else, Mike, that you want to share on this topic um, that comes up for you before we depart for the day? The, the one thing that I had written down in my notes was if you have if you get stuck, just think about mentors and role models and people you look up to in your life mm. and not not who they are, but think about what you respect or admire about them. You know, there's character traits, for example, I think about, you know, you think about Tiger Woods. I mean, he just played mm. in the Masters and it's amazing. And and if you if you have someone you know, I, now, if you look at Tiger Woods as a whole person, as a human, is there's a lot of flaws there as a human. But if you look at Tiger sure. Woods as how he shows up for his profession. Uh, and coming, recovering from the car accident, recovering from the back injury, and like all of the things that, the, that he demonstrates, you could probably draw out discipline. <laughs> you could probably draw out mm. dedication, like some of these core values, perseverance, potentially yeah. perseverance, right? That's like, wow, those are great character traits that I see in him that I would like a little bit more of. You know, you could draw some of those out of people in your life, and it could be celebrity type figures like a Tiger Woods, or it could be like my dad, who's ambitious. Mm. You know, look at my dad as a whole. It's like, well, there's a couple of things that are maybe flawed there, but I look at his ambition. I look at his drive and it's like, wow, I like, I want more of that. You know, 81 years old, still working six days a week. Uh, when I look at my dad and I see how much fun he has, you know, it's mm. like how, how, how caring he is. These are beautiful character traits. It's like, cool. I want to draw some of those out and have a little bit more of them. So 
I would encourage you if you're as you're listening to this is just think about people that you have in your life, mentors, role models that you say, wow, there's some character traits that I love about them that I want more of in me and I want to develop a little bit more in me. And then you could kind of come up with what is your word to describe that that aligns with you? And then how do you define that word? Boom. Now you have one of your five or six core values. And that's an e another easy way that you can go through this exercise. Uh, absolutely. Great reminder. And it's so true. And I think it's, um, it, you know, we admire people for a reason, right? Uh, unconsciously, we're drawn towards people. Unconsciously, we're attracted to people uh, and that, that are doing things the way we, you know, we believe people should be acting. And so those are role models for you. Uh, so again, you don't have to model everything about somebody else. Uh, everybody has flaws, including ourselves, but it's what is it that you do admire in these role models and mentors? So it's a great reminder there. Well, hey, this has been so much fun. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic. Uh, if you have any questions on it, feel free to uh, shoot us a message. And uh, until then, leave today better than you found it. We'll see you next week on the Better Than Rich Show. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the show, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from us, you can follow us on Instagram at better than underscore rich and join our Facebook group at the better than rich show. Thanks again for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time. And remember, leave today better than you found it.